with us today, our, our, our guest speakers for the afternoon, is Toby James, who's head of politics at the University of East Anglia and specialises in electoral administration and Kyle Taylor, who's the executive director of Fervo, which is a campaign group for electoral uh, transparency and reform. Uh, and he's also the executive director of Hacked Off as well. Um, so I suggest how we do this is that Toby talks a bit first, uh, then Kyle talks, does his bit. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions, then I'll open up the floor. Um, I'll be taking questions in groups of three. Um, and the easiest way to do that is if you can raise your hand in the chat and then basically whoever raises their hands first, it'll, it'll, it'll come up in, a, in an order. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to hand over to Toby. The floor is yours. There we go. Um, okay, great. Can you hear me okay? First test. Um, so thank you so much, yes. Pascal, and to the Open uh, Rights Group team uh, for inviting me to take part in the conversations. Uh, it's an honour to be here virtually um, and I'm um, looking forward to hearing kind of all your views on it. Um, I mean, I've got some initial kind of thoughts to kick off the conversation. Um, and I mean, it can't be stressed enough that we are you know, literally living through uh, unprecedented times. Uh, COVID-19 is an unprecedented threat uh, to human life. Uh, very difficult times, uh, very troubling times. Uh, but it is also uh, an unprecedented threat to democracy and literally around the world as well. Um, there have been some claims, for example, Joe Biden saying, you know, we've lived through uh, we've held elections during wars, even invo evoking um, the kind of imagery of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, for example, you know, the civil war there. Um, but this is unprecedented in terms of um, the nature of the threat uh, and how it's going to um, impact on democracy, I think. Um, and it was a great essay question that uh, Pascal and the team kind of set, which is in, in, in terms of you know, what role is technology going to play here? Is it going to play the, the superhero role of uh, keeping democracy um, online, uh, kind of resuscitating democracy, keeping things things going, or, or is it going to pose um, even kind of greater threats? Um, and I guess in trying to answer, trying to think about this, I always go back to this the question of what is it? What is it that, that democracy actually is? And you know, we could speak for a long time about that. Um, and there's lots of functions and features, and it does mean different things to different, to different people, but certainly two things that are really important uh, that I kind of wanted to focus on a little bit uh, were two core institutions and two core practices. And the first one is parliament and well-run parliaments and legislatures and how, and how important they are uh, for uh, democracy. Um, and the second one is around elections. <clears throat> So I'll take each each of those in, in, in turn. I would very much welcome your your thoughts. And so it doesn't obviously cover everything that's important for uh, for democracy in terms of civil liberties and the media and, and digital rights and everything else. But certainly these things are are, are really important. Um, and it's and parliaments. It seems uh, somewhat strange in many ways to to point to the importance of of, of parliaments because especially in the UK, as in many countries, parliaments tend to be particular. Uh, unpopular people um, tend to think of this as a place which is packed full of old white men, uh, which it is. Uh, they tend not to have very strong um, public uh, ratings. I think there's a survey from a couple of years ago that said something like 90% of people were proud of their firefighters or NHS workers, um, and 28% were, were kind of proud of, of, of their um, M MPs. Um, but it does play a really, really important role. And some of those things that it, it does, it passes laws, um, whether this is on the budget, or this was on NHS funding. Um, I think there's currently 237 laws stuck before parliament. Um, it allows us to hold the government of the day to account to make sure that they're making decisions um, that are the best decisions in the, in, in the public interest. 
it allows us, it allows uh, the kind of deliberation over legislation. Um, although Parliament's often kind of seen as punch and duty, and it is punch and duty, um, the fact that you do have an opposition going gung ho for for an uh, incumbent government um, does, in theory, keep them on their toes. And of course, it provides representation as, as well. And so we can very quickly see how all of that has been undone in uh, you know the past. Uh, weeks and months. Uh, Parliament is now closed. Uh, it's closed for early recess until the 21st um, of, of April. And so many of these core things that Parliament is supposed to do for us, uh, it, it is unable uh, to do. So this, le this legislation uh, has been put on hold. Uh, what's needed for many kind of other policy areas. Parliament parliamentarians are unable to kind of meet uh, in, in, in person. This is not just the fact they can't get into the chamber, it's all those conversations that are had in the fringes and the cafes and in various for forums in and around Westminster that makes a big difference. Um, this prevents um, people holding the government to account and, and, and discussing, deliberating on, on policy. And it means that we, can't, we don't have effective representation as well. We do not have, um, there's an MP who can um, put, pose those questions in Parliament becomes very, very difficult um, for uh, parliamentarians to be able um, to meet with their local constituents as, 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 as well. They'd usually hold, for example, surgeries um, where they could raise issues. But here, clearly, technology, I think, could be um, not, not, maybe not quite the saviour, but it can keep the show for democracy um, on the road. So it does seem uh, ineminently sensible and, and plausible and doable for votes uh, to, to take place over digital means. I mean, uh, different parliaments have experimented this in, in different ways, whether it's email or uh, video conferencing or other kind of um, me mechanisms. Select committee hear hearings can very naturally kind of take that forum uh, as, as well. Uh, the tabling of questions, um, becomes uh, possible. Clearly this is not, you know, a virtual parliament is not perfect, um, but it's certainly better uh, than no parliament. And one of the reasons why that is possible is because in this kind of forum, transparency is a good thing. Um, there is no ballot secrecy. When an MP goes along and votes, um, how they vote then goes on to the public record and it then becomes possible for um, everyone to see exactly you know, how, how it is uh, they have voted. And technology has therefore already uh, made parliaments in the past few years much more transparent and open-ended. So the broadcasting and archiving of, of debates, uh, the online Hansard, uh, the vote checking, um, these aren't things that the everyday citizen necessarily use, but it does allow a kind of an element of uh, data uh, science and data journalism, um, which is um, possible. So this is a moment of national crisis um, of a virtual parliament that can hold the government to account, it can ask critical questions um, over particularly how it's managing COVID uh, seems um, like a very, very um, good, good way to, to, to go forward. And the second area is elections. And this area is, becomes a much, much grayer area though. I'm, I'm a lot more pessimistic about the superpowers of, uh, of technology uh, in some ways. And I, I, you know, I don't really need to kind of preach um, the importance of elections you know, for most people. This is how we get you throw the rascals out, as it were. It's how you uh, make sure that your you know, ineffective leaders and representatives are replaced with those that you want uh, to kind of represent you as as, as the citizen. Um, but clearly, the, the world's capacity to hold elections has very very strongly uh, been hit. Um, the UK local elections that were due to be are taking place uh, next month uh, have been called off um, so they will not be taking place um, over the, the course of the last month or so at least 47 other countries have decided to call off forthcoming uh, elections um, and the reasons for this are you know uh, pretty obvious there's there's dangers here um, it's a humanitarian risk in many ways to hold an election during um, at the peak of the COVID crisis. This will, um, as public health officials in the US have you know, been making very public in, in Wisconsin in the last week, uh, this will spread 
um, and accelerate the spread um, of, of the virus and it does pose a risk to, to human health. It's also um, in many ways, I think I've argued this on the Democratic Audit blog this week, uh, that um, it's actually in many respects anti-democratic to carry on with elections uh, during, during this period of time. Um, you, you will get lower turnout, um, and we've seen that in many of the contests that have taken place, whether that's in Mali or the first round of French uh, municipal elections that did, did place, take place a few, week, few weeks ago. And it's obviously, probably, I don't know for certain, uh, more likely that people um, who have those underlying health conditions or worldly might be more uh, likely to, to think twice uh, about, about going and voting. It's going to hit contestation of elections. It's going to prevent people from, um, perhaps it's easy, easier in some ways for, for parties and leaders, if they're in governments, to go out and use the state media, uh, as has been claimed in Poland, so to kind of um, canvas and still get a public image. While opposition parties are locked down and don't have access to those resources, it can make elections very, very um, unfair. And it also reduces opportunities for deliberation. And it's an open question how important those canvases are that go and knock on our, our, our doors and um, encourage us to go and vote for one party or another. But that, that type of conversation um, offline arguably is, is, is still uh, particularly important. So can technology kind of save this? Um, I think in many respects, I'm much, much more, more skeptical. I mean, there's a bigger debate here about what we think about e-voting um, and obviously there are, uh, I think we'll probably have this between us shortly I and mean, personally um, I think I'm the, of the never say never uh, approach and um, I, I'm very skeptical about holding a major national election using something like e-voting, perhaps there's some innovations that we could do at, at a local level uh, that, might, that, might, that might be useful and might be worth considering. Uh, but we're not there yet. Um, but can technology, internet voting, be useful in this crisis? And I think um, I'm very skeptical um, uh, about, about that insofar as um, it takes a long period of time. And we have postal voting, and that is the obvious way for many countries, including the US, to, um, to enable people to, to still take part um, in elections. And postal voting is not perfect, but it's still, um, it's still really important. The one area where perhaps a technology could play more of a role in the crisis and thinking closer to home is in terms of voter registration though. So we will have the annual canvas usually takes place between August and December. It's staggered at different times around uh, the country according to how local authorities or local registration offices want to kind of manage that. Um, and that does involve, uh, it will be a brand new, there's a brand new process coming in this year. Um, but it will involve some door knocking, chasing up on people who haven't replied, checking whether they are there or otherwise. Um, and that is where, obviously, we don't know where we're going to be in August, um, but there is a risk um, that COVID will affect uh, that process. And so at that point, there, there are possibilities with thinking about things like automatic voter registration um, that will be worth considering uh, more uh, in, in the future and possibly even uh, for um, uh, for the autumn um, uh, as well. So those initial thoughts, will technology save this? Um, I think it's vital for, for Parliament. Um, not necessarily quite so clear for elections, probably not on election day, but possibly um, for the voter registration process um, here um, across, across the UK. Brilliant. Thanks, Toby. Um, it's really um, enlightening and uh, illuminating to get your get your thoughts there, and I'm sure we've only scratched the surface of all we have to talk about, really. And I definitely look forward to digging deeper into some of those issues in a sec. Um, I'm going to turn now to Kyle. Um, Kyle's had lots of experience in this area, both on political campaigns and in holding the use of technology in democratic processes to account um, and so I look forward to getting getting his perspective on this weird weird time we find ourselves in. So, go ahead Carl. Yes thanks so much for hosting and thanks Toby for the fantastic remarks. I'm gonna um, try not to repeat anything Toby said 
um, and just touch on some of the stuff and, and um, sort of flag a few other things I think are important. Um, so Fair Vote just published a report actually in January that followed a six month consultation where we took evidence from the Electoral Commission, the ICO, Facebook, um, over 70 sources, including Open Rights Group, uh, maybe some of you as well submitted um, about, you know, uh, democracy in the digital age. And interestingly, you know, the idea of people not being able to physically go somewhere to vote and therefore needing a digital solution just didn't even come up because, you know, we, we can't be looking at world wars as the comparisons. We need to be looking at uh, moments in time where human interaction is, is, is not feasible. Um, and, and that's the real problem statement here, right? The problem statement is that people can't be near each other. And so when we're thinking about solutions, we just have to work from that point. You know, nothing else really um, in terms of, you know, this question is at, to me as critical. Um, and we've also to say as well, we've just launched a, launched a mini consultation specifically on this question. So we're seeking people's ideas on those two questions that we're talking about today. Um, to write a full report um, on how a government functions and how elections can function. I think Toby's right to really distinguish between them. Um, <clears throat> the distinction for me, there's sort of three points for each. From the government, in terms of how a government functions and a parliament's ability to vote, um, you know, there is an absolute immediate need because parliament will need to be voting again within weeks. Um, there is complete transparency in the vote. We know how MPs voted on each uh, 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 division. Uh, and third, they're in a privileged position in that uh, there's a limited number of them, they've been elected, and so we can find a solution, um, and I agree with Toby, that can be through uh, tech that will allow the government to function. To me, this isn't a huge crisis. It's more a policy question and a procedure question than anything. Um, and so, and I think that, you know, the um, European Parliament went to e vote by email on the 23rd of March. You know, there are lots of ways we can do this. It could even be a video chat <laughs> where uh, an MP dials in and someone is in a division hall mocking them off in an extremely transparent way. It could be on BBC Parliament Live. You know, you have that feeling that you, what you've seen is what you're getting. Um, elections, of course, are the much bigger um, issue. Um, now there's an urge, but it's not immediate. Um, the, our next democratic moment will be May of 2021. And, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking that that election has to happen. So we have to find a way for it to happen because you can't permanently uh, put democracy and elections on hold. Uh, then you're living in a authoritarian regime. And despite, you know, some democratic leaders perhaps preferring that, um, that isn't what, what is best for our society. But the, the key difference first is that, yeah, we have a year, so we have some time to come up with a solution that's the most sensible. It's secret, right? So we need a system that preserves secrecy, but guarantees transparency and faith in outcome. Um, and there is discrimination of access. Right. This is the this is the fundamental problem with voter ID laws, um, regardless of how your position on um, national ID cards, unless you're providing them all free to everyone, then you're inherently limiting suffrage. So and we look at the same thing if we're finding a tech solution. Right. I mean, we're now assuming people are online. They potentially have a smartphone that will likely have some form of ID authentication, whether it's a fingerprint or face. I mean, that is a huge leap. And we're seeing that with COVID, it's becoming so acute because uh, the most vulnerable are the least likely to be able to access online resources. And most solutions, with the exception of obviously the incredible mutual aid groups and other community organization is all online, it's all tech solutions. Um, so there's that discrimination factor that we need to, we need to think about. And this is much more a political question than a policy one. And I say that because the reality is that if there was universal voting, progressive parties would win most elections. Um, and that's true in most democracies. And so there is a political incentive for some parties in a, a, a party political um, country to not encourage more voting. And so when you look at, for example, the most obvious solution, which is vote by mail, um, that sort of already exists, works, and has extremely low rates of voter fraud. 
um, across the board, there's ex extremely low rates of voter fraud, despite what um, the sort of the stirrings that um, are, are made. But vote by mail means that everyone is more likely to vote and therefore certain parties will be more adversely affected. So, you know, the, the government function side is more a policy question as I say, and the election side is really more a political question. There are, are some, some parties will be worse off uh, through greater suffrage. So uh, I agree with Open Rights Group's position and Toby that I don't think a digital solution will work for elections, um, but we just have to go back to that problem statement, which is simply that people cannot be near each other, so we have to find a different way. Um, and you know, he is the mother of invention. You know, we, we will have to find a solution because we will have to have an election. And that's sort of where we need to sit in this space is say, okay, there's an election in May of 2021. We have to be able to hold that election. Um, and that's how, you know, regulation has fueled innovation historically. And it's how I think um, this situation will fuel innovation in a space to get to something that makes sense. I'm not sure if everyone has already received their letter from the government with the pamphlet on how on COVID and the letter from the prime minister. So we know the government is capable of mailing something to every household. Um, and if you look at um, Oregon or in the United States, the way that um, paper ballots work is everyone receives them in the post and then there are giant ballot boxes um, all around that you go and, and drop through. Um, and so if you find a way to allow social, for social distancing within that, then you have a solution that is proven um, and has worked there, I believe, since 2005. Um, so yeah, just to sum up, government functions, use tech, elections, no tech. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Kyle. Um, really, again, another fascinating set of ideas. Um, interesting that you guys seem to kind of broadly agree. I'll try and tease out some tensions over the next 15 minutes um and so yeah i think let's do like 10 15 of i'll ask you a couple of questions have a bit of a discussion and then we'll open it out to the the, the raised hand raised hands in the chat um so i think first of all i want to talk about something that you both raised which is um so we, we kind of agree that the question of running a government is more of just a kind of technocratic policy issue um, but that elections are a little bit more difficult. What do we what do we do when elections come along? I mean, we've got, I think the biggest election around the corner at the moment is obviously the U.S. presidential election, right? And um, unless unless we put that off, uh, it seems that there'll have to be some sort of postal voting or uh, remote voting. Um, so. In this, in this situation, as, what, as Kyle says, we have to come to a decision. What do you both think is the preferable decision to, to reach? You know, postal voting, remote electronic voting with all the risks that entails. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts for the upcoming US presidential election? And let's open with, with Toby again, I guess. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks both. Um, so I think in terms of I, mean, I think you're right in saying, in terms of um, what's, what we're facing in the UK uh, at the moment, not too many people would, would have missed the, the local elections hugely. Um, adding a one-year mandate to people's term of office isn't going to be cause too many um, um, uh, consequences uh, for democracy in the UK. But the US presidential election is kind of the elephant in the room in many senses for the, for the, for the whole world. This is, this, is, this is a big deal. If, if you... If, you, if, you, if we go back to 2016 and we say, um, you know, one of the, the candidates who went on to actually win in the end was, you know, publicly said that he was not going to accept the result if, um, well, no, I'll he didn't win. Phrasing right there. Uh, he would say he would accept the result if he won. Um, so there's huge issues about um, kind of trust um, in, in the process there and, and um, a lack of, lack, lack of confidence that, Kind of came came through that, um, so the U.S. situation is extremely fragile. Um, I mean, the solution is that basically um, everyone in you know, all states should open up um, universal um, mail balloting for those for anyone that wants it, basically. And 
um, that would at least um, allow uh, the election to take place. It would allow everyone to um, to uh, vote clearly through those through, through those mechanisms. You could keep the polls open. Um, you would reduce the traffic that would go through there, and it would just be much safer uh, across the board. The reality is going to be very different to that. Um, so, for those of you who know lots about how elections are run in the US, um, it's an extremely decentralised system with each state having its own um, way of, of, of running uh, the election, which means that you get, um, in every state, you get very, very deeply ingrained politics. And so you, you saw that this week with Wisconsin, um, you know, you've got public health officials saying that this election should not happen. You then get the, the governor uh, wanting to postpone uh, that, that election. He was then overruled in the Wisconsin um, Supreme Court by a Republican challenge, um, which then, and there was then a separate uh, challenge in uh, the US Supreme Court, um, overruling the use of um, um, the way in which they're going to extend absentee balloting. So that is a precedent that's been set now. Um, there is what should happen, uh, what is best in the interest of democracy and the electoral process, but there's going to be a lot of partisan fighting in the courtrooms in the next in the next few months, and every every case that happens is just going to ramp up um, the the arguments. It's going to ramp up the partisan nature, and I'm really really worried about what how how, how exactly that's going to uh, pan out. As it stands, there's time to do something. If if there's no action taken um, for months. Um, but all of a sudden it's going to be a very, very different situation um, come uh, November. Um, yes, yeah, so I was actually co-manager of the coordinated campaign for Hillary for America in North Carolina in 2016. <laughs> so I have extremely first-hand knowledge of, of, of this particular question. And as Toby said, every state is different. In fact, in some states, every county is different, a different voting machine, a different structure for polling places and so forth. Um, the big shift, and what happens is because the um, election is run in the state by, the, um, by someone who's elected and partisan, it means in a state that has a, a Republican, um, oh God, I can't remember the, the role, not attorney general, um, the, the person who heads the election, if they're a Republican, then the, the first thing they do is um, close voting sites in low income areas. So to limit access and ensure that people have to wait longer. Um, and the vote, when the Voting Rights Act was um, overturned, um, re uh, just it was, that was the first election, what you saw was um, huge voter discrimination where, um, as Toby's saying, you're already looking at potentially lawsuits now. There are lawsuits right up until 9 p.m. on the day of the election to get injunctions so that people can still vote. Um, again, because it's a political question, you know, the more people who vote, the less likely Republicans are to win. And that's the, the real crux of it. And the, the difference with, um, I think, Trump is that he's sort of just already said it. You know, if more people vote, Democrats win. So we know his starting position. Um, I think with uh, what we have to, to look at is a court challenge that, um, that will go to the Supreme Court, but that is um, argued on constitutional lines as opposed to political lines. So while the court is 5-4 Republican appointed, what we know is that there are two justices um, in um, the Chief Justice Roberts and um, in uh, Alito who have tended to vote with um, con on constitutional grounds with Democrats. So if you can, if uh, I know the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union is looking at this um, and a few others, but if you can find a lens to make the argument that it, where it's based strictly on uh, strict reading of the constitution, there is a chance you could guarantee um, at the very least, I think that the, the goal is all vote by mail, at the very least, an ex extremely extended voting period time. So some states have early voting for a week or two weeks before, but you could potentially look at having six to eight weeks of early voting um, and use a lottery system where you're assigned, you know, every, every citizen based on their social security number is assigned a period of three days in which they're allowed to vote. So it limits the number of people going somewhere on a period of time. Um, if there's no, there's, the political risk of not having an election is, is too high in the United States. I mean, it, 
the the fever pitch of like it being um, bridging on potential civil war is real. I mean, these are the conversations that people are having. Um, and so it, if, if there isn't an election, you will see horrific violence, I think. Um, having grown up <laughs> there and how quickly people just turn to, you know, buying a gun and shooting someone. Um, so I think, uh, I know the ACLU is already working on the lawsuits. I think you'd be looking at um, urgent lawsuits in June, July. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. What and what and do you do you, do you have any idea of what you think that will how that will go? I think I think the ACLU the ACLU has the best track record with this court in making strict constitutional um, arguments um, that sort of ignore the politics of it, um, and they've had two big wins that they did not expect. Um, so, uh, my best friend is a senior litigator at the ACLU, so I have a bizarre amount of knowledge on this, and she worked on both of those suits. So, um, I think the likelihood, if you can make a strict constitutional ground, which will have something to do with probably the 13th, 14th amendments, um, around, um, access, um, and the other thing to remember is that, um, I think historically with um, the way that the, the role of power in all of this historically that you know the oppression is mostly of, of something like this is usually to a marginalized group and while we're seeing that low income and marginalized groups are being more affected by COVID the, the general sense is that anyone could die of this and so even the most privileged people are worried about um, the solutions that because they're it's their own mortality so there's greater incentive you just universally for people to want to find um solutions because even the, those in the most powerful positions are, are adversely affected so i think if there's a high likelihood that the supreme court could rule um that the election must happen and that there must be alternatives and then it's just a question of how they define the alternatives Oh, you're muted. There you go. <laughs> um, wow, thanks for that both. Um, I guess that kind of leads me on to like a related area as well, which is that, um, Joe, what do we think about the relationship between uh, digitalizing democratic processes and trust in the outcomes of those processes? Because to me, it seems a lot, one of the kind of real questions around you know, digitizing elections is trust in the legitimacy of the outcome. And I think that's got kind of further implications for the US election as well, because when Joe Biden the other day was talking about, uh, let's have a, a virtual uh, Congress, Democratic National Congress, um, for the, um, to, you know, fully establish the, the nominee. Yeah. No, I guess the convention, the, uh, the convention, yeah. The convention. Um, even though, even though he's already assumed for the nominee, um, the fact that he's such an establishment figure um, and is advocate for that might kind of undermine trust in the in the legitimacy of the event. And okay, maybe that's a bad example because we know he's assuming. But um, what do you think broadly about the effect, the, the relationship between digit, digital elections and trust, Toby? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think digitalizing Parliament, uh, which is a nice not quite what you asked, actually intuitively, intuitively, we actually increase tr trust because I think I'm not referring to any uh, knowledge of polling here, but I think there's almost an intuitive thought that, well, why can't we see what goes on in Parliament? Online? Why can't we see how our uh, how, how how the voting process takes place why why do why do people go into this special corridor around the back of parliament where uh, you're not allowed to take photos you're not allowed to video it and if you're an mp you'll get in trouble if you do take a, a selfie and put it on uh, on twitter um i think that the absence of, of of tech in that situation kind of undermines trust in in, in, in some ways although that's the uh, that's a, a, a random hypothesis without much kind of evidence behind it um 
but with elections it's very different because um, there is this sense of uh, you know um, to to enact change to make uh, election laws different to bring about you know some change in, 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 in some way that can usually only be done by the people um, that kind of win the contest or in that example you just gave perhaps are going to be candidates in that contest and so they're they're intuitively um, going to gain or lose uh, as, as, as a result of um, some of those some of those reforms. So I think anybody making proposals towards digitalization, towards using e-voting or otherwise, um, often brings up kind of partisanship claims. Um, and I completely agree um, with um, you know everything that's being said about often, often politicians do in the U.S. There is evidence that um, they do often think about the consequences of um, trying to um, depress the voter turnout among some, among some particular groups. Uh, but often it's also the case that there's kind of a perception and reality issue there. Um, so um, I think any change is, in the US in particular, is, is often being driven through this kind of lens that it must be because they want to, they want to, they want to win, or that's, going to, that's going to help them. Uh, win. Well, that is usually, but not always, um, uh, the case. Yeah, I mean, all I would add is, um, I agree with all of that. All I would add is that, um, you know, I, I voted in, in two countries, the US and the UK, and in the US, you punch it, your selections into a screen, and it doesn't even print out something to verify that, in California, that you've actually um, done anything. I mean, it's just stored in the system. And that's been how it's been for numerous, several elections, as, as long as back as I can remember. 2004, I think, was the first time that I used that machine. Um, so having been in the UK for eight years and voted in, I mean, how many elections have we had? A million? Um, but putting that X in a box and then having been an election agent and watching all the ballots dumped on tables, folded and placed on a table, and then monitoring the whole thing does give you faith in the outcome. I've never left a count thinking, well, that's not what happened. Whereas in the US, um, if you combine the sort of uncertainty around did my vote get processed with the how did the person who got 3 million more votes lose, you're already starting from a much lower baseline in terms of the system itself being unfair. And then, of course, now the votes will be unfair. So, I mean, I think you, the, I think digital voting absolutely undermines for people over, I don't know, 30, 35. And I imagine people under 30 probably have a much greater faith in something they do on their phone actually counting or mattering. Um, so it is, there's a generational question there as well. But I mean, ultimately, it should just be an X in the box that gets counted. Um, whether that's by mail and there's cameras that are showing you the count or, um, it's in person, it, you know, the, the faith in it comes from the physicality of it um, from, from, from my perspective. Great, thanks, thanks Carl and both and Toby, sorry. Um, I've got, what well, I'll ask one more question quickly and then I'll open up to the floor. Um, it seems to me that during this whole period of crisis, it's actually a, a really great PR opportunity for big tech to really kind of refashion itself in this moment of crisis as, as you know, a sector that offers solutions rather than just causes chaos. Um, and I think so far, you know, it can be said they've actually had a pretty good pandemic. Like it's been quite kind of good for their kind of reputation. Um, and so we're at this kind of uh, crossroads for big tech and what's one thing you think that they could do that would enhance their reputation vis-a-vis -vis democratic processes in this period of crisis and what's like the worst possible thing that could go wrong for them at this moment um i guess i'm still going first am i <laughs> 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 you get some thinking time there, Carl. Um, do, do you want? I'll go. Do you want me to go? I don't mind. Uh, yeah, go, go, go. Yeah, Carl, you go. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's interesting because with my hacked off hat on, um, I have a different pers 
perception, I think, of how people are viewing social media, because most people are viewing it as something that absolutely can't be trusted. Um, and because it's so acute right now with misinformation in terms of, you know, bad information potentially could cost me my life, people are really tuning in um, to this acute moment of crisis. Whereas, you know, we've been in a democracy crisis it, that has it, that tech has pay, played a huge role in for four years, but because it's a slow moving train and it doesn't feel so in the moment immediate, we're not um, responding to it in the same way. Um, I think in terms of a, a moment that they can make something of would be to just ban political advertising um, and to bring in a coalition of groups that are, you know, independent, um, you know, so you're looking at like a full fact, crowd fact, media matters, you know, a few different groups that look at the uh, Snopes, that look at um, factual, uh, the facts of information and make it extremely transparent that here's what these groups think of these statements um, on a virality test. Um, even for Facebook where political advertising is the, the highest, it's, I think it's less than 3% of all their revenue. So it's, it's, it's not a money question for them. It's a broader business interest question. You know, Facebook has huge interests in Trump, Trump winning, winning re-election for Securities and Exchange Commission stuff around mergers and that being blocked. Um, the thing that could go terribly wrong is, um, I, I mean, I think that they, uh, you know, there's a sort of anti-vax crisis level um, specific thing that they allow to perpetuate um, that is ex um, extremely, extremely harmful. Um, for, for Facebook, their biggest risk factor in this crisis is WhatsApp, for sure. Um, you know, messages are being shared behind encryption. Nobody knows who's seeing what. We have people in several different WhatsApp groups um, who share with us the stuff that circulated. And it's 10 times worse than anything you see on a public page on Facebook. Um, and it spreads, it disseminates so quickly. Um, so their, their biggest risk is that they simply, you know, don't take it seriously enough or allow something to, to go too far. That's a good point. I mean, I've seen some absolutely shit things on WhatsApp, frankly. Um, and it's amazing that people make, they, they, they mock up documents to look like their NHS publications or official government publications. Um, mm. And I'll just say the, the 5G one, I was in a taxi in um, Nottingham in early March. I mean, first week of March and it, uh, excuse me, no, last week of February. And, a, and the cab driver said, well, it's all being caused by 5G. Heard it in my WhatsApp groups. You know, and that WhatsApp, that WhatsApp story has only really been public, what, a week or so, 10 days? And we're talking, you know, this is five weeks ago. Um, and that's the downside of privacy. <laughs> Toby, do you have any thoughts? Um, I guess, in, you know, there's lots they could do wrong. Um, I mean, things that, I mean, some elections will take place and if there's scope for innovation to actually bring about um, some genuine mechanisms for deliberation, which aren't kind of, um, you know, millions of people watching the screen and just being focused on uh, the candidates, but there's actually some some way of trying to in, enable conversations kind of cross households. Um, that would be amazing, um, and making that kind of take off in some way. Things they could do wrong. Well, I think we, to some extent, already kind of seen that in in some ways, which is is if um, technology is used. Um, poorly um, too quickly in, in, and in an untested way um, for part of the electoral process and so you, I think you saw some of the primaries there where there was actually apps being used to receive votes in Iowa and actually have them kind of tabulated and counted and you know there were big delays and problems and it came out that these apps actually hadn't properly um, been tested and that's kind of set you know that's caused that caused chaos in the, the real actual electoral process and obviously, uh, it, it's not good news for uh, any kind of tech company um, as well. Thanks, Toby. Okay, I think I'm now going to open the floor. I can see we've got a couple of questions 